Well, welcome everyone and good morning. We are excited to join you for a jam packed couple of hours for the 2021 Abner W. Womack Missouri Agricultural Outlook Conference. As I said, it is an absolute honor to be here this morning. This conference is sponsored by the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute, MU Extension, and the Abner Womack Excellence in Agriculture Fund. We are excited you are here. So much has changed in a year's time. So as we kind of provide an outlook in 2021, we'll take a look at the dynamics at play in the markets today and what could be ahead, giving you a glimpse of what the expectations are from our experts at FAPRI. Well, a little bit of background. Uh, for nearly 40 years, FAPRI has provided objective analysis and markets and policies to decision makers, as well as stakeholders on how changes in policies or market conditions really impact farmers and ranchers in the agriculture industry as a whole. So today, this is the seventh annual Abner W. Womack Conference to highlight the findings in the recently released 2021 Agricultural Market Outline Baseline book. And then we'll have some conversations around other important topics. Now, many of you know Abner Womack, of course, and you know him personally from his years of dedicated service to Missouri agriculture. But as co-founder of FAPRI in 1984, his impact on the agricultural industry has been immense. I mean, when you look at what he accomplished and the impact he's had, and among the list of recognition for his service, that includes the American Farm Bureau Federation's Distinguished Service Award. That was awarded to him in 2014. And this conference, really, when you think about it, it's a testament to Abner's dedication, to his service, to the U.S. agricultural industry as a whole, and more specific to his support of Missouri agricultural producers. So Abner, thank you so much. We are excited to kick off today's conference. Well, we really have a busy agenda today, a very busy agenda. And as I mentioned, it's only two hours. So we'll have your attention for the next two hours as we really highlight some important dynamics at play right now in the markets. So we'll have presenters, we'll have panelists, and we'll provide market and policy outlooks on issues facing the agriculture industry today. And then what could be on the horizon? But before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping items and some announcements to make sure that your experience today um, is, is really maximized. So we encourage you to submit as many questions as you'd like, either by name or using the anonymous function. And it's really easy on this platform. You just do it with the Q&A. So questions can be su submitted at any time using that Q&A chat feature at the bottom of your screen. That's where it's located. If you don't see that Q&A logo, just hover your mouse near the bottom and you'll see that, two, that toolbar pop up and, and it should appear. Questions can also be emailed uh, to our business support specialist, Warren Jackson. That's Jackson L A at missouri.edu. Again, jacksonla at missouri.edu. That address is on your screen. Questions will be asked to presenters at the end of each presentation, or we'll have time at the end to also answer any questions that maybe we didn't have a chance to get to during today's webinar. However, if we do not have time, because some of the presenters have a lot to talk about and they're a lot of time, um, you know, a full list of questions and answers will be posted to the conference website found at fapri.missouri.eu under the events after uh, the, the conference today. So just know we will try to get to all of your questions as we have a lot to cover. And if you would like to follow with today's presentations, a PDF of the slides is actually available right now on the conference website. That's under the Outreach Then Events tab highlighted in that purple section right there on your screen. You may have also noticed, noticed that moments ago you were asked to confirm that you were aware that this webinar was recorded. So there will also be a recording in case you missed anything and you wanna go back and listen to it. We are trying to make sure that everything is available at your fingertips at the conclusion uh, of our conference today. But I do have three asks of you today. One, if you want to stay engaged uh, and, and follow along, ask questions. We want this to be a conversation. The more questions, the better. So I ask you also share this information with others in the food and ag industry as, as we really highlight some important topics today. Also, program, program evaluations are important. They're important to the folks at FAPRI. They're important to this conference to make sure that we get your feedback and really customize the experience to what you would like to see next year as well. So make sure to fill that evaluation out. That will be about three minutes. Uh, that'll take about three minutes to fill out and you can um, do that at the end of today's conference. But to kick things off, what better way 
to kick off this conference, but with Dean Daubert, he is our first speaker. He is the Dean of the College of Agriculture, Food and Natural Resources at the University of Missouri, um, but he has an extensive background in the food and agricultural uh, arena. He was a professor in the Division of Food System and Bioengineering. He actually joined the University of Missouri in August 2017 from North Carolina State University. Thank you so much, Dean. Take it away. Welcome to the 2021 Abner Womack Missouri Agriculture Outlook Conference. This is the seventh year for this event, and I am grateful for the robust program that talented folks at our Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute, or FAPRI, have put together for you today. Thank you all for joining us. Dr. Womack Abner, for whom this conference is named, is a professor emeritus of agricultural economics in Kavner, and he is one of the co-founders of FAPRI. This conference was established in his honor to showcase discussions on the agricultural market outlook, policy issues, and other topics important to Missouri agriculture. Thank you for your vision, Dr. Womack. Thank you also to Tyne Morgan for hosting today. Tyne is an alumna of our college and has been a great friend to all of us. Most of the rest of us have been managing okay through the past year of virtual events, but Tyne is a true professional. She always makes our virtual events better. Kaffner is almost exactly at the two year mark for our first ever strategic plan, the drive to distinction. Ever-changing environmental, economic, technological, and sociological forces, including food needs, climate change, agriculture advancements, and health demands for humans, animals, and plants will impact our future. These changes shape our research, student training, and community connections. Missouri is fortunate to have strong agriculture, natural resource, financial and healthcare industries as allied partners to provide Kaffner as part of Missouri's land-grant university an opportunity to affect the lives of every citizen by providing unbiased, relevant, and accessible education, information, and resources. Imagining a healthy world, our unifying theme, means we work in a coordinated way to meet these challenges to improve the health of our environment, food, economy, and our people. As part of our strategic plan, we identified six strategic priorities, seven programs of distinction, and a handful of grand ideas, all to move our college and this great state forward. We were proud to designate FAPRI as a program of distinction in April 2019. FAPRI has a long and prestigious history, and we commend all of its accomplishments and its faculty members who are critical to the success of the most important industry in our state, agriculture. FAPRI recently marked its 35th year. It remains well known in policy circles, both in the US and around the globe including current connections in South Korea, Ireland, the UK, and South Africa, and with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, and FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. FAPRI alumni can be found as heads of major commodity organizations in prestigious positions at FAO, and most recently as the USDA's Chief Economist. Of course, I'm talking about Seth Meyer. I'm grateful to have Seth with us today. He will be speaking with you very soon, in fact. Kaffner and Fapri serve Missouri's food and agricultural community and are working to address big challenges in our world today. Thank you for being with us today. You are in for an informative morning with this slate of presenters and topics. Enjoy the day. Thank you, Dean, so much. We appreciate your support uh, and we appreciate the kind words. But with that, he mentioned Seth Meyer and we wanna get right 
into Seth Meyer. Um, I would like to introduce Dr. Seth Meyer. He was appointed USDA's chief economist this past January, returning to USDA after previously serving as the chair of the World Agricultural Outlook Board in the office of the chief economist. Now, the board is charged with bringing together USDA's resources and the assessments of crops around the world. And these findings are actually published in the closely watched monthly WASD report. So he has experience in there, has experience there. And now prior to his return to USDA, Seth was a research professor and the associate director of FAPRI right at the University of Missouri. And he's also previously served as the economist with the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. Seth, a long list of accomplishments, but today you join us as chief economist of USDA. And I'm gonna hand it over to you because I'm excited to hear your ag outlook this year, Seth. Hey, thank you, Tyne. It's a shame we can't be together and have some barbecue out at the, the research farm, but let's jump in. You know, you and I talk all the time, got a lot of subjects here to cover. I, I think this is my opportunity to ask all the questions that uh, Pat and Scott Brown can then come and answer afterwards. We keep getting, you know, when I do these outlooks, your hope is always that the answers come in faster than the new questions do. But I think that this is one of those years where I'm not convinced that that's uh, been the case most recently. So let's jump in here. I'm going to try and cover a lot of ground. Tyne, you and I can talk as we go along. And uh, so, so um, you all can see my screen here. Well, let's just jump in. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures, but I'm going to talk about a lot of these pictures. So I don't want you to focus too much on all the numbers and the details because I'm going to talk you through them all. This one is basically, you know, when we think back and some of you will remember the Great Recession and we had an economic contraction then. We had an economic contraction called the Great Recession and along with it went a decline in consumer uh disposable income, kind of their purchasing power. This latest event that we've gone through has been drastically different. First of all, we had a much sharper contraction in our economy, and yet at the same time, because of stimulus and other, other factors about where folks are working and how they're taking care of their lives, we actually saw disposable income go up. And now we've got another round of stimulus. So this does, in fact, have uh, pretty interesting effects and uncertain effects as we roll forward about how folks demand, the demand side of this looks for meat and agricultural products. The other part of this has been, you know, that, that big dip there in that chart around 2009 is the same Great Recession, where we saw trade in both ag and non-ag goods contract. It's a very different situation here when we look about the pandemic and how the economy has fared and how ag trade has fared. As a matter of fact, we didn't see, you know, ag trade has fared better in both instances, but in this case, we didn't see a contraction in ag trade. And we'll talk more about that because it has been one of the features that has moved ag prices higher in the last several months. Okay. So when we look at this in general, though, I think we can talk about the fact that at, at, a, as a, at a global level, as Pat and Scott start talking about how do things look in the near term and then farther on, is we find ourselves currently in a situation where global supplies have tightened quite a bit. We've had a couple years where consumption at a global level has exceeded production for corn and soybeans, and even wheat, where we've had consecutive crops larger than demand, even there, we've seen that at least tighten up in the most recent year. So we're in a situation where global supplies have tightened. And really, you know, I break this year up. I mean, I break this, this, this last 18 months up into two periods, almost like they're, they're, they're completely two different eras. We're pre-August of 2020 and post-August of 2020. And when you look at this, you can really see how market prices turned around here for both corn and soybeans, and maybe more recently hogs. And we can have that discussion, but I'm guessing Scott will pick up on those intense hog discussions on yesterday's hog and pig report. Uh, but when you look at this, you know, it's really a pre- and post-August world of difference in terms of commodity prices. And when I look at that, this is a graph. I don't want you to think it's, it's, it's not that complicated when I want you to focus on a couple of different things. This is kind of the change in what folks thought or, or, or the expectations of USDA, both before August and after August. And what I'd really draw your attention to is these supply bars, which is our thoughts on the supply size of the corn and soybean crop after August began to shrink, right? So while, while we can talk about 
this being in part in terms of weather, other factors, but we definitely ended up with smaller crop, a, a thought of smaller crops are after August than we were thinking before that time. At the same point, I want you to draw your attention here, which is exports. So instead of rationing demand on a smaller crop, we actually saw exports rise into that shrinking crop, adding further fuel to those higher prices. Okay, so what's driving this? Um, you know, part of this is an expectation that the Chinese have really attempted to rebound from their hit on African swine fever. So pork, uh, so their animal numbers starting to rebound and along with that feed. So here you see those effects of ASF. And I will draw your attention here to the fact that this graph starts in 2010. So you've got animal numbers which are flat and then begin to decline with ASF. Why do I bring that up? Because even from 2010, we have seen increasing Chinese soybean imports through that period. So we have increasing Chinese soybean imports and crush as they, as they were, as they were uh, going through their hog rebuild here at the end of the period. So we see a sharp rebound in imports and crush and over time, some commercialization of those rations. So this is a big question, which is right now we see a sharp rebound in sound numbers and along with that demand for imported soybeans. But it hasn't just been soybeans that the Chinese have been pulling in. So here, there's, these are two different graphs. They don't show exactly the same thing in each pane. On the right, this is soybeans, which says everything they import, they crush. They're incredibly import dependent when it comes to soybeans. They bring in almost all their needs for crush, for meal, for feeding uh, pigs, uh, chickens, aquaculture. They bring almost all their needs in. On the other side of this is the fact that they produce a lot of corn. And while there has been a lot of news about their imports of corn, it remains a small fraction of their production. OK, but we've seen both of these products really surge when it comes to trade with China. Part of this being that there is an incredible uh, margin between internal per corn prices in China and what corn prices are outside of China. U.S. corn fob gulf, the bottom line is simply what that corn is priced at at a boat in the Gulf of Mexico. The gray line is simply what that corn is priced at sitting offshore of China. So that very narrow margin, but inside China, what it takes to get that corn inside of China is an additional $150 a metric ton, more than $3 a bushel, nearly $4 a bushel additional inside China where prices are running over $11 a bushel. So there's clearly a demand for that corn within China, but this isn't the first time we've seen that, that gap. So this, again, raises that question of is this transient demand from China or is this, you know, a persistent demand for chi from China where we've turned the corner and they will continue to import corn pretty steadily. One of the key features, I think, for outlook over the next couple of years. Again, another complicated graph that I'll try to tell you. This is a graph of corn equivalents, all stuff that feeds like corn that's going into China. I have purposely labeled everything here in blue because it's another important context where we've seen similar volumes. We've now exceeded them, but we've seen similar volumes back in 2015 of them importing corn-like products. Um, but that included things like DDGs and Australian barley and sorghum and lots of other things. But you can see when you go forward, everything in blue being corn, they are more focused, focused on corn than they have been in the past. So really, you know, while volumes are now starting to exceed that level, it is incredibly corn focused, which has been to the U.S. producers benefit. We'll talk more about why that is. You know, there was a lot of speculation early on about whether they would bring in that volume of corn. The Chinese have what's known as a tariff rate quota on their corn that basically says they can bring in about 283 million bushels of corn cheap. And if you want to bring in more than that, you'd have the, to pay uh, a tariff on it um, that can be waived, right? But the fact is, is there is more on the books just from the United States than that tariff limit. So it is almost as if that, I would speculate that that tariff limit is at least currently not binding. 
they've got more on the books and are incredibly likely to exceed that TRQ. And so somebody has access to that Chinese market and is not paying the tariff to get it in there. And again, the economic benefit of doing so is more than $3 a bushel if you can get it in. So when you look at this, you know, we presented our uh, thought about corn exports from the United States balance sheet at our own Ag Outlook Forum. And you can see that we expect a strong export number for the US in the coming crop year. So that 21-22 crop year is the crop that folks are gonna be putting in the ground here in the coming weeks. And you can see that that's quite a strong number. In order to get to that kind of export number at the kind of prices we are expecting, you really do have to see continued Chinese demand about at the same magnitude that it has been this year. So going forward, at least in the short run from USDA's perspective, that demand stays there. Um, but it is also interesting. You know, We have lots of questions where the Chinese are bringing in a lot of corn versus corn uh, uh, substitutes, let's call it, at the same, so they, and then the prices are very high, so clearly they need it, and yet they continue to maintain uh, phytosanitary restrictions on Brazilian corn, uh, which limits their ability to bring in any of that corn, and as you know, they've been growing as a supplier into the world market. So again, a question where the Chinese are, are limiting one of the top exporters of corn into their own market. Uh, Brazilians, we'll turn real quick to South America, and this graph is just to show you, yes, you've heard lots of stories about the South American crop going in slow. At the same time, prices have been rising. So as a, as a producer, even if you think you're going to take a hit on yield because of the lateness of the crop and the potential for dryness at the end of the season, prices are high enough that you'll take that risk. So again, record Brazilian corn area. So we'll see, that remains another significant variable in the short run about how this market turns out. And of course, weather always has the last say. We've seen some improvement. You know, I'm actually sitting here in Columbia, Missouri myself, and you know, we had a couple of good rainstorms and they've changed that calculated soil moisture percentage and it really improved that across several locations, including parts of the wheat belt. But we'll see how those crops turn out. Again, both USDA and FAPRI would do a normal, normal weather forecast. And that does in itself suggest higher acreage just as we come off of two years of very high prevent plant. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit time. We're gonna, you know, these are my basic points about the market. I don't think there's anything surprising here. We've got GDP and disposable income uncertainty, which I talked about. We continue to see, we moderated supply chain impacts, about, particularly on the slaughter side, but at some cost, we continue to see odd disruptions like uh, container shipments affecting dairy products. Prospects for both crops and livestock, I would say our vision of those Supplies have been shrinking at the same time demand has been robust. China is going to be a key element for trade. No surprises there. And we see report, receipts from the market repay, replacing some of that needed ad hoc assistance. And of course, weather will have the last say. Before I go, let's talk real quick about policy. And Tyne, you know this, I'm not a policymaker. I'm a career official in USDA. But these are the things that these policymakers will be struggling with. We've got biofuel policy in terms of there is still large outstanding issues in terms of US, the EPA's proposals, which are delayed. In the short run, it's going to be motor gasoline consumption. When we talk about COVID impacts, we talk a lot about disruptions between what consumers are paying and what producers are getting for their product. And there has been a tremendous amount of money flowing from the government on supply chain resiliency. So that's a, then another feature of policy. So when we look at coronavirus food assistance program, and you and I talked about the fact that they, they released some of these programs that had been under review recently. And I think you'll continue to see that. We had CFAP 1, CFAP 2. CFAP 2 has been reopened to try and get better coverage to those producers who might've been missed. And yet we look forward beyond that and there are still may and shall provisions out of legislation that has been passed. On top of that, the American Rescue Plan, which might deal with things which were, you know, food box style programs and other linkages between consumers and their food needs. And on top of that, you know, the other thing out there, which is getting a lot of attention is anything related to climate smart agriculture, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, sequestering carbon. And my office put out a uh, federal register notice to solicit from all parties what they think these programs might work uh, how they think they might work to get 
financial incentives on working lands for producers, uh, you know, that work them, that work for them, support local communities. And at the same time, you know, USDA is real interested in, in talking to policymakers what programs are available to them now that they can get started right away. And we're collecting, we continue to collect that feedback. So I think that there's a lot of action going on there that you and I can talk about. So that was a lot of information in that short amount of time. Uh, and it you and I can talk for hours. So yeah, it was it was a lot of information, but it looks like we you left us 10 minutes for questions, Seth. So that's great. I'm gonna jump right into this, okay? Because we have a few questions coming in. The first one, Seth, is is China's corn demand increase due to implementation of the aggressive biofuels mandate? So no, I don't think it's that case. We have seen a couple of ships of, of US ethanol go to China. So that's another that's been another option. But I think that that again, we have limited view inside the Chinese market, okay? So this isn't from them grinding, uh, you know, trying to achieve this mandate. It is, in fact, we, we don't know what the balance is here, quite honestly, because they don't share it with us. Is it that they are running stocks lower than we anticipate? Is it that demand has really rebounded and that rations have changed for swine and they're very much focused on a commercial ration? Is it just that they are focused on corn when they might be more broadly taking in different products? You know, they still have DDG limits on us and they're fighting with the Australians so they won't take their barley. So, so no, it's not related to that, but it does remain a question of why so much is flowing. Yeah, and, and on that topic of China, you mentioned the TRQs. You know, I think that's frustrating for those watching the market because there was no official announcement from China that they raised that 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 TRQ level. Yet they are importing a lot more corn. How do you hold China, what what mechanism is there to hold China accountable when it comes to those TRQs? Yeah, so so it's you know be, because it's a loosening of the TRQs, you have really limited ability to do to do anything about this. But you're right, which is. They are simultaneously, and, and there was an official announcement. The official announcement was we're not going to raise it at the and then in the in the subsequent weeks they blew through it, right? And and so when you look at what's on the books now, the TRQ doesn't mean a lot as long as the Chinese want it. And so what you try and balance is how tight are things within China? But remember, they have SPS controls on Brazil. So to me, that suggests they need it but they're not desperate for it because those SPS issues stay in place. One more question before we move past China, because there's a couple more beyond China. Uh, but when you look at the things like ASF popping up, hearing more about that, and it just seems like maybe there's some more trade tensions that maybe we're watching that, that are coming forth and we're seeing that possibly in the cotton market this week. Seth, are you concerned about Chinese demand um, considering there are some question marks popping up now? You know, I, I think for me, it's more of any time that you uh, put all put too many eggs in one basket. That's always a concern, right? That's, I think, always a concern. And the volume of agricultural products for which the Chinese take is huge. And, and particularly for the kinds of things a Missouri producer produces, right? Corn, soybeans, pigs, uh, you know, hogs, and then to some extent, cattle. Uh, you know, they take they're they're taking beef now. So to me, there's always some risk involved in that. There's always some risk. Well, speaking of that risk, Sarah Schaefer wants to know, beyond China, where do you see demand growth opportunities for U.S. grain? So I, I think demand beyond China for U.S. grain, I think we'll have a general, you know, if we have a good, solid global recovery coming out of COVID, I think you'll see a general increase. I think there are opportunities going forward, maybe in some other places in South Asia, and uh, you know, so maybe Southeast and Southeast Asia in terms of of, of place Southeast Asia in particular in terms of corn. And um, but I think in the short run, with those SPS issues in place, we will probably lose some of our traditional corn markets, maybe Japan and send that corn to China. So I do anticipate that maybe we will get a little shuffling of trade in the short run. I'll leave the longer run demand picture. We'll get, we'll get Pat's view on that one. <laughs> All right, Pat's listening. So Pat, write that down. Remind me yep. of that in a second. All right, another question. How do you see Brazilian area expansion for soybean production evolving in light of ever-increasing societal concerns regarding deforestation and some of those, those things that we've been watching? Yeah, so I think if you look at this, um, there's two issues. First of all, that the stuff that's coming into production isn't rainforest land, quite honestly. It's not. It's other kinds of land. And when we talk about harvested area in Brazil, remember, 
a fair amount of that harvested area is coming as second crop behind soybeans in a place like Mato Grosso. You're planting soybeans and then you're coming in immediately behind it and planting corn. So it doesn't necessarily, so when you see area expansion, remind yourself that that's not all physical area expansion. It's also double cropping. And the, the economics of that in the short run are such that, like I said, that you're, you're, you can't, you plant the soybeans late means you plant the corn late and there's a very defined dry season. So you are at risk when you put that corn in late. Okay. They go ahead and they're putting it in now because prices are so high. Even if I take a 30% ding on my yields, I'm still money ahead because prices are so high. So continued area expansion, the economics are there. When we think about the needs of the world growing and where area will grow, that's where it'll grow there in Argentina incentive to plant beyond the the, the uh, normal date, huh? Sounds like we had that a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, you know, when you look in the light of recent Missouri legislation that suggests establishing a mandate on the biodiesel blends that all gas stations in Missouri offer to be at least 5% blend biodiesel in petroleum pumps, are there any conversations on any biodiesel mandates to carb emissions on a federal level? So, uh, you know, biodiesel is, so biodiesel is obviously part of the uh, renewable fuel standard at the national level. And there is always a conversation in terms of, you know, when, when I have viewed in the past, not in my current position, in the past when I viewed this, there's always a combination when it comes to biodiesel, which is what's the available capacity, how much can they produce, what does that, you know, what pressure does it put on that marketplace in terms of perhaps vegetable oil prices? But certainly in that industry, what we have seen is a sharp increase in capacity in that industry. So, you know, that will be one of the factors I think that they can, that the EPA will consider as they put out the new rule. Okay, a couple more questions real quick. Do you think that ethanol demand has topped out and we will never get to pre-COVID levels again? So I think... I'm not saying, you know, the worst, the last thing I want to do is say never, right? I think there are some real challenges out there for ethanol demand um, in terms of just how much folks are driving, right? And I think we, we, so I think there are two issues. I think most of this is driven by policy, to be quite honest with you. Do we have E15 labeling that says, okay, even if motor gasoline is stagnant, E15 here is an opportunity for us to grow demand without folks driving more. Because I think if you had, if you try to tie this to folks driving more, I'm not convinced that that's where it's at. So to me, one of the big policy drivers here is E15, and then what the EPA su suggests mandates will look like after the volumes end in the legislation. On top of that, exports remain a real opportunity if we see prices for petroleum continue to rise and other folks push their environmental policy objectives through ethanol. And are we seeing that in China right now? Are those are those purchases actually shipping, Seth? So I think we've seen a couple ships load. I think it's an opportunity. Um, you know, it, you know, do they do they want to take in corn and make the ethanol? Do we want to take in the ethanol? Is this is this a tip of the hat to phase one in order to, to say, hey, you know, we're buying your products? for this previous agreement. Um, I guess I'm a little hesitant to say, I think that I know that they'll take large volumes into the future. Okay, last question real quick. You mentioned CFAP and your net farm income forecast that came during the Ag Outlook Forum in February. You had net farm income this year down and that was largely based on no ad hoc government payments coming out. So, I mean, is it, the, the payments that came out this that were announced this week, were those included in your original net farm income forecast? Right. So the Economic Research Service did include some of those things which were included. They, they, they projected based upon the pro we talk about CFAP AA being yeah. held back and reevaluated by the incoming administration, and then parts of it moved forward. ERS has included, had included some of those provisions anticipating that they would in fact be made. So when you and I talk about a removal of ad hoc uh, uh, disaster payments, there's a little bit of what's there already included. There's been more things which may influence demand that have been included since, um, but really what we're talking about is a transition from ad hoc payments to money from the market. 
And, uh, you know, you and I talk about, hey, a dollar from the government spends the same as a dollar from a producer, but it maybe it feels a little bit different in your wallet. So, you know, they've been those dollars largely being replaced by money from the marketplace. Seth Meyer, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us. Big week next week. So Seth Meyer, thank you again. You can continue to have those questions roll in and we'll make sure to get those. They assume that the current or announced policies are extended in the future, but it allows for researchers and policymakers to also evaluate future policy changes. Okay, so joining us today in order to digest all of this, we have the dynamic duo, I'm going to call them. We have Dr. Pat Westoff and Dr. Scott Brown joining us. Everyone knows that Pat Westoff, director of the Food and Agricultural Policy Institute. Um, I will let you kick it off. Uh, Dr. Westhoff, a lot to talk about today uh, before we hand it over to Dr. Brown. With that, Dr. Westhoff. Thanks a lot, Ty, and thanks uh, for hosting today. Uh, okay. you, you failed in, in your mission though, in one important respect. You forgot to ask Seth the most important question. Why in the world did he leave FAPRI? I still been trying to figure that out today. Well, uh, well, I knew that he still has his hand, you know, there's still a tie there. And so I could tell it was hard. It was a hard decision to leave FAPRI. <laughs> All right, folks, we're going to talk about a variety of things today, but I want to cover uh, our discussion about uh, the crop sector in general and about U.S. farm income and say a few words about the macroeconomy as well, if I can, like my slideshow on here from the beginning. There we go. All right. So I'm talking about the factory outlook, about the general economy, about the crop sector outlook, farm income, and then I'll turn things over to Scott to talk about livestock and dairy. Uh, about the outlook, you know, so we've been doing this, as Tyne said, for a long time now, since the 1980s, back when I was a graduate student at Iowa State University, working with Willie Myers there and with Abner here at the University of Missouri. Uh, this year's timeline, we started uh, the process back in November, putting together a preliminary baseline uh, based on our analyst judgment and the models that we've been maintaining for all these years. That was reviewed in December. We normally have been in DC, but of course, this we did virtually. I uh, had good participation from folks around the country and even from around the world, giving us good comments on their preliminary baseline. Came back to it all again in January, building in the uh, new USDA reports, in addition to uh, taking into account the comments we received. During the month of February, we spent uh, a lot of time trying to look at all the uncertainties that, that surround that baseline and uh, coming up with, with uh, ways to generate distributions around the prices and production and income and so on that come out of that process and released the formal US baseline on March 12th. And that's available, of course, on our website. Uh, it's not just us here at the University of Missouri FAPRI who participate in this process. We have great collaboration from Scott and Daniel here at the University of Missouri, from the FPC group at Texas A&M, University of Nevada contributes on grains and oilseed, uh, World Trade, University of Arkansas on rice and Texas Tech on cotton. Uh, as uh, as hinted hint by Seth a bit earlier, uh, you know, this baseline is based on what we knew back in January, sort of like USDA's was based on information from late last year. It does include USDA's final estimates of 2020 crop production and so on, but would not include the February or March reports from USDA or other recent news. You know, for example, right now it would appear that China's probably going to buy more grain this year than was expected back in January. We do try to, you know, assume current policies are going to continue. So that means we've incorporated the 2018 Farm Bill. We've incorporated the relief programs that were passed in 2020, including the $20 per acre payments that were authorized in December and just announced by USDA on March 24th but would not include uh, provisions of the reconciliation bill that was uh, passed earlier this month, you know, the, the, the freedoms of loans for uh, socially disadvantaged farmers and the like. Um, the corn and soybean now looks slides that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. We'll show some updated information. First about the general economy. So obviously we had a sharp reduction in general economic activity in 2020, as Seth talked about already. Recovery does appear to be underway, but employment GDP remained below pre-pandemic levels. We have a lot of uh, fiscal stimulus already with more coming and lots of uncertainty going forward. Uh, just to kind of remind ourselves again, Seth, there's some of this already, but you know, we had very stable economic growth between 2010 and 2019. I don't think there's a period in US history we had 10 year period 
with growth as steady as it was over that, that period of time. It was never below 1.5% nor above 3.1% in this country. Of course, a sharp drop because of the, the COVID crisis last year, a strong recovery this year, and then an expectation of about 2.5% growth for 2023 to 2025. Taking those same numbers and presenting them a little bit different way, uh, this is just putting the overall level of GDP, real GDP. And you can see how you know, a nice straight line fits that data pretty darn well between 2009 and 2019. Uh, we have the recession there obviously in 2020 and we're clawing our way back, but it's not until 2024 that we really get back to the longer term trend based on IHS markets view of the, of the economy. Uh, lots of other analysts have weighed in here and have generally have a fairly similar story, but of course, just how fast we recover and what the, you know, what the future looks like in the economy matters tremendously to the ag sector. Another way of looking at that is unemployment. You know, if, you know, if we've talked the unemployment rate is off on the one side, most of life turned it around and look how many people are actually employed. And so we had a sharp drop in the number of people employed last year, especially in the second quarter of the year. We did have uh, you know, some recovery in employment occurring in the last half of 2020 into this year and expected to continue into 2022. But no, it's not until sometime next year that we would finally get employment back to level it was uh, before the COVID crisis hit. The federal budget, again, these are numbers from January, might look different today, uh, but more than a $3 trillion deficit. You know, when the previous record was 1.4 trillion, a $3 trillion deficit in fiscal year 2020, uh, a smaller deficit was projected back in January for this year with the, uh, the new stimulus package approved in March and talk about maybe some additional spending later this year. We'll see if that proves to be the case. And then even if with strong, we have a good strong economy, uh, recovery of the economy, we are talking about trillion dollar deficits pretty much as far as the eye can see. Uh, so that does mean there could be at some point in the future be pressure on, on the federal budget and people looking for ways to, to restrain spending although that has clearly not been the, the primary order of business uh, here in the near term. Exchange rates are very important. I expect a couple of them here to highlight uh, with the European Union, the Euro rate has gotten, the dollar's gotten a bit weaker against the European Euro, Union's currencies and against uh, China as well, but maybe not quite as weak as IHS market had been projecting for this year and beyond. A weaker US uh, dollar means a little bit stronger ability to sell our exports in foreign uh, countries. Finally, on the macro side of things, uh, looking at uh, real consumer spending on food and, and how, of course, the crisis affected things. You know, the amount of money Americans spend on food for consumption off premises, stuff we buy at grocery stores and supermarkets, went up pretty sharply in 2020, expected to be very high again in 2021 as we ate more food at home, less food at restaurants. You see the sharp drop off in spending at food service, restaurants, and the like. Uh, last year, some modest recovery this year. But IHS Mark is not projecting getting back to something more like normal until 22 or 2022 or maybe even 2023. Uh, Seth talked through this one, Ray. So I'm going to just kind of skip this to remind yourselves that you know lots happened since August when things looked pretty dismal. You know, the price of corn's now projected to be a dollar higher than was expected to, to be uh, back in August of last year because of smaller U.S. crops and stronger export demand. And we alluded to the, the story on, on uh, the COVID crisis and its impact on driving and ethanol use. So in 20, uh, calendar year 2020, we saw a sharp drop in the amount of gasoline used in this country. Since almost all ethanol use in 10% uh, blends, that caused a corresponding drop in ethanol consumption in this country as well. As we look forward, uh, we're projecting, yes, a recovery in gasoline use the next couple of years, but we don't really get back to the levels we were at um, you know, prior to, to the pandemic. We are, we're seeing you know, uh, increased efficiency in, in cars, where, and, and of course, at least some adoption of electric vehicles as well. Uh, so if you look at the two lines here, uh, the, the right-hand axis is gonna give you the uh, amount of ethanol used uh, in this country. Uh, and the left-hand axis is going to give you the amount of uh, motor gasoline used. When the blue line is above the green line, it means that we're using a little bit, of, at least a little bit of ethanol in blends above 10%. So we do expect to see some more E15, more E85 as we go forward. But unless there's a major policy change or unless something else changes the story very dramatically, we don't expect to see a huge increase in uptake of those higher level blends. So now the following slides will be based on an updated outlook for uh, soybean and corn markets that I prepared this week. Uh, for the most part, the, the, the differences from our 2021 FAPRI outlook are pretty small, but just to, to make sure you're aware of that, this won't be exactly what appears in our outlook book uh, that was published last week. 
So as uh, Seth said, if we, if we have more normal spring this year, you know, which is a very big if obviously, and it's wet here right now here in Missouri, as you know, uh, we could be talking about a big increase in acreage of both corn and soybeans in 2021. We were projecting a little bit over 90 million acres of, of soybeans planted in 2021. If we have the normal share harvest and then a trend line yield, we'd be talking about production about 4.475. So almost 4.5 billion bushels of uh, soybeans produced, which would be an all time record. Um, but even though we'd have you know the, a record high level of, of total production, with a sharply reduced beginning stock figure for 2021, we'd be talking about a total supply that's actually a little bit less than it was going into the 2021 marketing year. So that would be bullish for prices. And that's indeed probably what we're seeing in the market right now that even if we plant a bunch of soybeans, if we have a decent crop, we could be talking about relatively tight supplies for the year ahead. On the demand side of things, again, lots of uncertainty. Uh, we have projected another good year on the export side. You know, about 2.1 billion bushels projected the 2021-22 marketing year. Uh, that would be, a, again, a very good year by historical standards, but not quite as good as 2021. This all depends, of course, on just how many soybeans China buys, how big the South American crops are, many things we can't possibly know with great confidence at this time. We were projecting a price uh, of about 10.50 or so a bushel for the crop harvested uh, this fall. That's a bit less than uh, than, uh, than the ag outlook form, number of 1125, and certainly a bit less than current futures are suggesting as well. If exports continue to be as strong as they, they have been in recent weeks, you know, a price higher than I'm showing on this chart is certainly very feasible. And you kind of see this in the chart looking at, at soybean prices. Uh, uh, the season average prices projected are uh, we've had over the last decade. Uh, the about $11 and 10 or so uh, per bushel price for the current marketing year, and then a bit of a dip in 2021 and 2022. But note that the futures price again is a bit higher for the November contracts uh, for, 20, for November 2021. If uh, you assume even normal basis that we'd have a bit higher price and shown in the chart. On the cord side of things, uh, again, likewise, we could have a, just a slight uptick in acreage this year, perhaps. Uh, some others are suggesting maybe a bit larger increase than I'm showing you here, uh, but something like 91 million acres of, of corn being planted in 2021 with uh, normal yields. Uh, we're talking about about 14.8 roughly billion bushel crop. So you know, pretty darn close to 15 billion bushel crop. And that would give us a little, at least a little bit of an increase in total supplies relative to last year's total supplies. On the demand side of the picture, you know, we do have growing livestock numbers, so probably a bit of an increase in feed and residual use. Uh, we'd probably expect at least a little bit of recovery on the ethanol side, as I talked about before. So that pushes up food seed and industrial use of corn. Uh, the export side of things, again, I think uh, Seth indicated, you know, USDA calling for roughly flat and even a slight increase in corn exports in 2021-22. That's certainly possible. And if China keeps buying at the pace they've been buying, that, that would be a likely outcome. We're showing here a bit of a drop off in 2021, assuming a little bit less purchases by China, uh, some pretty strong competition overseas. But still, 2.4 billion bushels of corn exports is a, a pretty good corn export number, far higher than we've had in uh, most recent years, except for 2021. Farm price about 410 a bushel uh, projected uh, under that combination of things. And so if you look at what that implies uh, relative futures market, it's actually relatively consistent with futures markets today, once you take into account uh, the, the normal base between December futures contracts and the marking your average price uh, that we'd be projecting here. And finally, just a couple wrap up slides on the big picture here. Uh, as, as indicated, you know, we had a lot of spending on ad hoc programs in the last three fiscal years. In fiscal year 2019, that was primarily the market facilitation program. Fiscal year 2020, it was the, the final payments under MFP plus uh, payments under the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. And in fiscal year 2021, the year in, year in right now, all the CFAP payments, and this would again build in the numbers that, from the uh, uh, bill passed last December, the payments announced by USDA this past week, uh, but does not include the provisions that are, are from the reconciliation bill. Note if that annex spending disappears, though, of course, we're talking about a huge drop off in total federal spending on, on farm related programs from over $50 billion in the current fiscal year to something more like $20 billion in fiscal year 2022. Uh, just going back to the normal combination of ARC, PLC, other basic farm programs, crop insurance, and conservation programs. 
So on the farm income side, it turns out that our bottom line story for 2021 farm income is actually pretty close to USDA's estimate released here a couple months ago. We're at $112 billion projected for, for 2021. Now that's a bit of a drop from calendar year 2020, but it's a heck of a lot better story than we have between 2015 and 2019 in terms of national net farm income. Uh, we have about a, a $25 billion uh, increase in um, uh, in uh, uh, crop receipt, crop and livestock receipts projected for the calendar year 2021, offsetting, of course, a very sharp drop in government payments and $13 billion in higher production costs. If we don't have more ad hoc payments going forward, we could see a bit of a further drop off in income in 2022. There are many relatively stable nominal terms thereafter. But note that even though that's a drop off where we were in 2020, it still would be a, a much better picture than we saw between 2015 and 2019. So that's why I wanted to, to stop my slide set here today. Again, thanks to the crowd uh, here at MU who helps put this together and all of our partners uh, across the country that are part of this process. Okay, with that, Dr. Westhoff, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and um, bring Dr. Brown in to give his update as well and then we will drill you with questions, okay? So don't go anywhere, Dr. Westoff. Um, but I want to hand it over to Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown, I know, you know, when you look on the crop side, things have definitely changed. But when you look on the livestock too, we have say, seen the market dynamics change a bit here just in the last month. And so uh, to give us an update on that, kind of a look ahead, Dr. Brown, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Tyne. It's uh, good to be on here for a few minutes, and I, I think we could talk about all these issues for uh, days on end, but uh, we're going to spend 10 minutes uh, trying to talk about what's uh, really happening on the livestock side. And uh, for, for me today, it's more about what are the risks relative to the long-term baseline uh, that was completed back in January that I think is important. And, you know, Tyne, we got some pretty big news even yesterday out of hogs and pigs that I think uh, makes us want to uh, to think hard about uh, maybe what's a, a more positive uh, look ahead. But as, as I kind of look at the issues and you're going to see from the few slides that I have for you this morning, kind of my risk as I set out there, uh, I, I think all of us are going to say China at some point today as, as we talk about risks that are out there. But I just go from a meat trade standpoint. Uh, it, it's certainly one that we're going to have to be, pay attention to. Uh, I, I, I uh, put the 2020 data up because I'm really good at forecasting the past, but I want to remind us that uh, when you look at uh, what, what we see going to China back in 2020, so about 1.7 billion pounds more meat products headed to China in 2020 uh, than, than the previous year, it, it certainly started things uh, off nicely for the livestock industry. Does that continue? Uh, how does African swine fever play out? How does the phase one deal play out going forward? I think that's uh, going to be important for uh, these markets as you look ahead. If, if we go to the forecast that we have, I will say that uh, uh, it, it looks to us that maybe the potential for beef exports to be growing in front of us uh, is uh, going to make those uh, uh, cattle markets more optimistic longer term. Uh, you look at the blue line that's setting here of, of pork exports, so so critical on what happens in terms of African swine fever in, in China in terms of our ability to be able to export pork uh, to, to China. We, we see a leveling off for the next few years before some growth as we look in the latter part of the baseline. Uh, given some of the recent concerns about rebreaks of, of ASF in China, um, maybe you were too pessimistic about that uh, trade as, as we look ahead and we'll get uh, stronger trade than we anticipated. We've kind of started the year slow on the pork side, uh, but I think there's some, some opportunities uh, as we look ahead. Uh, I, I've in single slides uh, tried to, to focus on each of the commodities that are, are most important here. And I, I do want to remind us as, as we think about the, the big picture for a minute, uh, meat production in this country uh, grew about well, 14, 15 billion pounds over the, the past six years or so. So we've been on this trend of more and more meat production occurring. 2021 is likely the change in that. Uh, supplies likely stall in terms of growth in front of us. That, that could give us some higher prices. And 
you know, Seth put up the, the chart that certainly showed just how dry it is in some of the western parts of the United States where we know we have cattle and cows uh, that, that could matter as we look ahead. So uh, I, I believe the supply side of, of cattle certainly uh, could be curtailed. If you look at uh, what we got for livestock slaughter out just yesterday, uh, first two months of the year, you know, we're down 4% in terms of cattle slaughter. I want to be a little careful with that number just because we had such cold weather there for a period of time. It slowed what we were doing in terms of, of sending cattle to the to the market. Uh, but uh, we, we are starting with uh, lower supplies. And I think that's important. Now, the demand side's been good. Uh, COVID-19 recovery to me, uh, I always say, I think folks are going to want to get out. And the first thing they're wanna, going to want to do is uh, go have a really good meal. And I think that might be a steak on the plate. Uh, so I, I get optimistic about uh, where domestic demand could go for the cattle industry. So you think about less supply and more demand, and I think uh, we, we certainly have the opportunity for some positives and higher prices as, as we show in the baseline. Well, on, on the hog side, um, so again, I go, we've got some different, uh, different situation here as we look at uh, hogs and pigs that we got yesterday. I see futures markets uh, uh, may, may lean hogs uh, going above 100 for us, at least uh, last time I looked this morning, uh, give us some optimism that uh, supplies are in better uh, check than we thought. Uh, just to start here, so hogs down 2% from uh, yesterday's report relative to a year ago and, and sows down 3%. Those were at the low end of pre-report estimates. Uh, so we, we may have fewer hogs to deal with in 2021 than we thought. Again, I wanna be a little uh, careful how far I go with that, but higher hog prices may be coming as supplies are in better check this year. And I think strong demand. I always say everything tastes better with a slice of bacon on top of it. And we've certainly seen that. Uh, you look at the pork cutout value that's been uh, nearly $27 higher than where it was a year ago at this time. It, it tells you we got some pretty strong uh, demand going. We're gonna have to watch feed costs here. Uh, so as, as both Seth and Pat alluded to, from a livestock perspective, I hope we get lots of acres of corn and soybeans planted, and I hope we have a really good uh, yield year to get feed costs maybe in a little better shape than where we currently sit. But if we talk about another uh, tough year for yields uh, in this country, I worry for hog producers, even with much higher hog prices, what their bottom line looks like. Um, on, on the dairy side, so it's 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 no... Uh, uh, not new news that, that we have the highest uh, dairy cows that we've had in decades. Uh, it's amazing how the supply side continues to grow. I, I like to remind us here on this front that stimulus matters here in 2021, food box purchases matter here in 2021. You look at the graph of, of cheese prices and look back at 2020, uh, we, they were much higher as, as a result of what we were doing in terms of, of food box purchases that had uh, cheese in that box. Uh, we expect those to come down as we don't see the same level of food box purchases uh, happening. Uh, at the same time, COVID-19 had a lot of impacts on the dairy side as well. As you think about uh, what were butter prices that uh, uh, fell substantially uh, in, in 2020 as we saw restaurants that were closed for a period of time. Do we get some recovery there as well as we get folks back out eating uh, more and creating some some additional uh, demand side on on uh, butter as well. I'm I'm more concerned, I guess, on the dairy side in that I think we're going to push a lot of supplies of milk on the marketplace here in 2021, uh, and and that could lead to uh, maybe some prices that that aren't so exciting, and especially when you put them against the backdrop of higher feed costs. So if I look at all of the all of these industries, dairy is the one where I'm a little more cautious about what the uh, future holds in terms of, of profitability uh, on the producer side of the equation. So with that, uh, keeping us on time, I hope today, uh, and leaving time for questions, I'll uh, turn it back over to you, Ty. Thanks for uh, doing this today. You're welcome, Scott. And we do have a lot of questions, so I'm wasting no time. Scott, first one for you. Um, as, as you look ahead, what are your thoughts on the, or reasons behind the sharply lower pigs per litter number out of yesterday's hogs and pigs report? I know you just said the supply game changed and this report showed that. What's the cause of that? Yes, yeah, so you know, I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if, you know, we aren't seeing some of the effects of, of pigs that were euthanized. Uh, and, and so if we go back to just what happened with COVID-19, I always say, you know, it's difficult to talk about a, a market ready hog being euthanized because there, there's not a shackle space to hang it on. 
it's it's easier in, in many respects, not easier in all respects, but easier in some respects to talk about euthanizing baby pigs. And, and are we seeing some of that in terms of not only what's been less pigs per litter, but then also fewer market hogs than we would have ever thought pre-report. Um, to me, maybe that's part of what we're seeing now. Uh, let's make sure we understand that could come back in the second half of this year with stronger supplies than we anticipate. So let's not forget, we're still fighting through those COVID-19 supply side impacts. Yeah, we, we heard a little bit about PERS and that's flaring up and really impacting maybe some baby pigs. Do you think that had anything to do with it or do you think it's mainly the impacts of, of, of COVID-19 and that pension processing? So I think it's a combination of all of the above. You, your folks are correct to talk about PERS uh, being, being some issues in some parts of the country. Uh, again, I just remind us when you're up against an elastic demand as well, if we are talking about tighter supplies than we anticipated, boy, this could look like a much better year now. We're going to have to feed some much more expensive uh, corn and soybean meal to these hogs. So it's not all gravy here, but uh, boy, I wouldn't have thought uh, we, we were going to be where we're at. And, and the report yesterday to me combined with then what's 4% less hogs that have been slaughtered in the first two months of this year. Uh, give me more optimism that the supply side is in much better shape than we would have anticipated. And that's after tying what's been five years of really strong growth in terms of pork supplies. Yeah, definitely. And Dr. Westhoff, I know on the feed cost side, you mentioned that in the USDA's net farm income forecast that maybe we weren't factoring in completely that higher feed cost. Do you think that's still the case? Yeah, I do think that the USA numbers are probably a little bit low on the feed side. We could also see higher costs of fertilizer and some other inputs as well. So even our $13 billion increase that we've got projected could end up being on the low side of what actually happens. Yeah, good point. Hearing about a 60% increase in some areas of things like anhydrous ammonia right now, mm -hmm. just major sticker shock for fertilizers. All right, uh, Dr. Westoff, what is your view on renewable diesel as a medium term driver of oilseed crush expansion in the US? Okay, that's part one. Part two of that is how do you balance this against the accelerating electrification of the domestic vehicle fleet and the move to electric vehicles? Yeah, there definitely has been a lot happening on the renewable diesel side. That is going to be a lot of the future demand for vegetable oils and other products that can be used to make renewable diesel going forward. Policy be a large part of that, obviously. You know, we have uh, we wouldn't have the industry we have were now for the provisions of the RFS. So that will be a very major driver in front of us. Uh, yes, electric vehicles are a huge deal. Uh, I don't know that's a, a big problem for our projections for the next couple, three years, but we're talking about projections 10 years, 15, 20 years out. Certainly, if we have a lot more of our vehicles being electric vehicles longer term, it becomes much more difficult to sustain the levels of uh, biofuel uh, uh, production use that we've got projected. Three minutes left. I'm going to try to hit on a couple more questions. Um, Dr. Westoff, what do you expect for soybean oil prices? Will it continue to drive the crushing margin, or do you expect this to be temporary? I do think this is a, a combination of a, a number of unusual events that have pushed vegetable oil prices quite as high as they are right this minute. So I don't expect to see prices stay quite this high uh, for the indefinite future. But certainly in the near term, yes, it is a larger share of the value of the soybean than has been the case in recent years. The combination of uh, lower than expected supplies of palm oil from, from Southeast Asia, strong demand from the biofuel industry, and just a, a number of other factors have all come together to, to push up that price here in the near term. Dr. Brown, you mentioned pent up demand that is happening right now in Kansas City. I mean, the lines are long. People are going out to restaurants more. So given the shift in stay at home versus eat out consumer spending brought on by the pandemic that we've been talking about, how does the return to prior patterns influence what cuts and Greg's grades are sought by buyers over the next several years? Yeah, so it's a good question, and I wish I had a, a perfect answer for that question. But uh, I will say, I think to me that the the, the very early here is going to be all focus on higher end quality products. It's the things that we typically talk about moving through that HRI side. So bacon being at the top of that list, as I said, everything that we go out and eat is better with a slice of bacon on top of it. But, but I think the higher end steak is certainly one that I'm going to be paying attention to. Maybe some of the more premium quality grinds of beef could also be at the top of that list. I think all of those restaurant opportunities are where we're going to see the growth. I sometimes go, what's going to happen to things like pork loin under this scenario? It's, it got strong in 2020. Uh, and I think that had a lot to do with what we were eating at home. And does that shift back 
uh, to where we have more trouble pushing those loins as, as we look ahead. Th those are the things I think that I'm trying to balance as I look ahead. Dr. Brown, Dr. Westhoff, thank you so much. We appreciate your insight this morning. Just had one question we didn't get answered, uh, but we'll try to do that in a bit. Thank you again. All right, now we're going to switch gears and we're going to dive into the ag finance side of it. Okay, so we talked about these market dynamics, a lot about supply, a lot about demand, a lot about, you know, net farm income and what that looks like. But let's not dive into ag finance. To start us off, we have Mark Ralston. He joins us from the Agricultural and Food Policy Center at Texas A&M University. He's going to provide some updates on the center's representative farm network at the center. Mark actually serves as associate director with a primary focus on analyzing the farm level impacts of public policy initiatives on the economic viability of agricultural producers. So, uh, Mark Ralston, I will start with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think he's getting things set up now. All right, looks All right, good. good morning. Can okay. y'all hear me? Yeah, we can. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, just wanted to thank uh, everyone there at Fafri for putting on this. This. Uh... Oh wait, hold on. Let me start my video. There we go. Uh, I didn't know once if again, COVID made to, you not want, you know, COVID made you not want to show your video. I didn't know if that was, <laughs> that was by design. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Absolutely. Let myself go a little bit, but I did put on a, put on a, a decent shirt this morning. So anyway, I just want to thank you all there for, uh, first of all, just for the, the chance to share some of the work that we do here at the Policy Center. I want to thank you on behalf of our co-directors, Joe Outlaw and Bart Fisher, uh, as well as uh, George Kanopic, our, our representative farm program director, as well as the entire team here that that does this uh, this important work with us. And we just can't thank you enough for the, the partnership that Fafri um, provides with us and uh, always been great teammates and we just always enjoy working with them. So uh, with that, just wanted to uh, basically kind of give a little background on what the Representative Farm pr uh, Project is here at Texas A&M and what we do and, and uh, how, how we approach this. Uh, representative Farm for us basically is a panel of four to six top producers, very influential producers, generally in major production region um, of the United States. Um, we basically go out and, and talk with and visit with these producers every two to three years after an initial meeting, uh, basically just to kind of uh, gather data, gather information on what, uh, what challenges they're facing, as well as all their uh, prices, costs, uh, prices received, costs, all the things that are necessary to simulate agriculture in their given area. Uh, we do that every two to three years, basically, just to make sure that we're still representing things the way that they should be represented in that, that given um, spot. Obviously, over the last year, face-to-face -face meetings have been um, challenging, if not uh, impossible. So we basically have somewhat pretty um, uh, dare say seamlessly transition to virtual Zoom meetings to, to basically uh, attempt to not fall too far behind the schedule because we do have 94 of these representative operations across the United States that we meet with in 30 different states. So you can imagine that um, if we take a year off, we can't, we can't afford to do that. So we basically have transitioned to Zoom meetings uh, in order to um, basically try to try to keep pace. Uh, we look forward to this being a temporary arrangement and getting back out in the field. Uh, in fact, here in Texas, we actually were able, we, we had approval to go do some uh, uh, in-person meetings this last week. So uh, we're looking forward to, to transitioning back to face-to-face -face meetings as soon as possible. Uh, we do have 94 operations, like I mentioned, in 30 different states. We have 64 uh, representative crop farms, uh, 20 representative dairies, and we have 10 cow-calf operations that we work with. We utilize a whole farm simulation model developed by uh, a lot of different personnel here in the AFPC, but particularly Dr. Henry Bryant has uh, developed our most recent model. Um, we are currently looking at a 2021 through 2026 projection period. And we do keep a couple of years of historical data, actually three years of historical data currently, just to make sure that we're, uh, we're all on the same page and we're actually representing what, what has happened at the very least, what has happened over the last three years realistically um, before we start making those projections into the future. Just like uh, FAPRI, we assume 2018 Farm Bill provisions are in effect for uh, 2019 through 2026, the end of our projection period. We made ARC PLC elections basically based on uh, what, what program um, was projected to give them the best uh, safety net option uh, based on ending cash in 2026. 
uh, we do make those adjustments based on what producers are, even if they're not behaving in our mind rationally. What we do is it, if they have a, everybody faces a unique situation. So if they have a different reason or if they're a, if they've made it known to us that they've uh, chosen a different different uh, safety net program, then we absolutely, when we find that out, as we uh, poll our producers, we absolutely make those adjustments to reflect what they're actually uh, participating in because we don't by any means always know what, what the best uh, option is for them based on just running our models. Uh, sometimes there's more at play than that. Uh, our analysis does include MFP uh, one and two and the CFAP one and two. We do not include the low. I know that Pat said that their projections did include the third round of um, of COVID relief, but we do not have that in play uh, at this time. I uh, just want to point out that those do those did uh, offer significant aid to most of our our operations and have really bolstered some of the near term outlook for our, our producers uh, that we work with. Basically, with our simulation model, like many like just like pat and everyone else uh, we generate more numbers than you can digest in a short period of time so we've basically summarized these into uh, uh, some color-coded more easily understood color-coded scores to kind of be able to take a glance and see what we think that uh, uh, the outlook looks like for our set of farms uh, we take uh, cash flow and uh, net worth numbers or equity numbers and uh, we basically take a take a look at probabilities of, of producers uh, being basically in the red at the end of having a, a negative ending cash position at the end of that projection period. We also take a look at that in the near term just to kind of give a uh, give an idea of where things are moving currently and where they move towards the end. So um, if you take a look, this is an example on this page of what um, I can share later where our um, where you can find our, our representative farm briefing book. That's what this is basically a sample out of a page of that. Um, but you can see there, this, this particular farm would be a Washington wheat farm. That's the WAW, that's Washington wheat. And then 2,800 would indicate this is a 2,800 acre farm. And then we would give a, um, an overall ranking for basically in the near term, this first year projected, and then an overall ranking for the 2026 end of that projection period. And that's all based on those probabilities you see out there on the, on the negative ending cash and, and the probability of, of real net worth declining. Bottom line, just to remember here, as you're looking through this, green is good, yellow is in marginal condition, and poor is in, I mean, and red is poor condition. One thing I also just want to remind everybody is um, our rep farm outlook is highly dependent on, on FAPRI's current baseline outlook. Um, it's basically indicative of the set of prices and uh, rates of rates of change on input prices and all the other interest rate and every other parameter that they provide us. So this is basically a great snapshot in time for what our outlook looks, but uh, for how our outlook is. But basically, this could change uh, at a moment's notice if they provide us another another uh, set of prices and other baseline information that, that could definitely change. Move try, try to move pretty quickly through these because we do have 94 of them, like I mentioned. We have them categorized by basically where a particular set of farms, uh, where they receive most of the, or where they earn most of the receipts. We have 25 representative feed grain and oilseed farms. We do have three in Missouri. Uh, we have two in Carroll County. That would be our MOCG 2300 and MOCG 4200. Those farms are both performing quite well. They're both in the green in the near term and in the, in the, projected 2026 period. We have one in Nottoway County as well, up in the Northwest corner of Missouri um, near Maryville. And that would be that MONG 2300. And that one actually is right there on the cusp of, it's right there on the line between green and yellow on the cash flow measure, but, but hanging in there really solidly on the, on the equity measure. So that one would actually end up being a, in marginal condition on our projection, but that, that farm's actually in pr pretty nice shape to be honest. We do have farms, I should have pointed out that we do have farms in Iowa, Indiana, Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, and then several in Texas uh, throughout the, the mid south um, About 70% of our representative farms are in good condition in the near term, with just under half of them in the, uh, just under half of them being in good, good condition at the end of the projection period in 2026. It's definitely an improvement. Uh, over pandemic back in the summer, we had some producers talking about they're uh, looking to hang it up. So we've definitely seen a rebound from that. Um, not necessarily out of the woods yet, but we've definitely seen a, a significant improvement since that time. Our representative wheat farms, they have 11 farms in five different states. Um, over 60% of the wheat farms are in good condition at the end of the projection period there in 2026. And we didn't really see wheat ride that, that wave down as much in the midst of the pandemic as some of our other uh, crop categories. 
We have 13 representative cotton farms in six different states throughout the belt. Uh, our cotton farm financial outlook has certainly been bolstered by, by both MFP and CFAP, especially in the near term. Um, we see that 11 of our 13 representative cotton farms are actually in good overall condition at there in the near term, with over still 60% of them remaining in good condition by the end of the 2026 projection period. And this is, um, I would have to say, this is the best uh, outlook we've seen for cotton since pre-pandemic levels. We have 15 representative rice farms in six uh, rice growing states. We do have a, a 4,000 acre rice farm down in the Boot Hill in Missouri. Um, also grow some corn. That's our representative rice farm from Missouri. Uh, I'd say we have every state with any significant production covered. Rice farms have not been as favorable um, on the overall financial rankings. We have 20% in good condition uh, at the end of the projection period, and we have 80% of our representative rice farms uh, in marginal or poor condition by the end of the projection period. Rice farms have certainly not rebounded uh, to pre-pandemic levels, but they've, they've definitely uh, improved since the, the baseline that um, Pat and Fabry provided to us back in June uh, in the midst of the pandemic. We have 20 representative dairies in 11 different states. We have a 550 cow grazing dairy in Dade County, uh, Missouri, down in the southwest corner there. Uh, our dairies do reach across the, the United States with some smaller dairies up in the northeast and then some larger dairies out west and in Texas. Um, half of our representative dairies are in good condition and half of them are in marginal or poor condition by the end of the projection period. Uh, dairies have also not, not really rebounded to pre-pandemic levels uh, where we would have seen about 60% would have been in good condition uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, they're overall in just slightly less favorable condition than we saw back in, in the, the June update that uh, the snapshot we would have seen under the June baseline update. We have 10 representative ranches in eight different states. Uh, we have a 250 cow operation down there in the, in the southwest as well of Missouri. Um, that's uh, in, near Lockwood. We also grow uh, corn, wheat, and soybeans on that farm and then have that 250 cow, um, cow calf operation there. Ranches are mostly, the rest of them are mostly uh, located somewhat in the central to uh, the western United States. Five of our ranches are projected to be in good overall condition at the end of the projection period. We have four of them in marginal condition at the end of the projection period, and only one of them there in a, our Wyoming ranch there in, in poor condition. So really just what I wanted to kind of tie this all up, uh, again, just appreciate the opportunity to share this and realizing we're kind of on a, a brief presentation time here, but we have seen a boost in, in our overall financial outlook uh, given this most recent 2021 baseline partly in due to obviously uh, improved prices, especially in the near term, and then the ad hoc assistance from CFAP. Uh, that's definitely, definitely helped. Um, even though this outlook has improved, just wanna point out that we, uh, we do still have 24 of our 64 uh, farms, of our, our crop farms are in, a, in marginal or poor condition in the near term with 34 of our 64 uh, in marginal or poor. So just over half of our representative crop farms are either in marginal or poor overall condition by the end of our projection period. So even though we have seen an improvement there, we still, uh, we still could see some financial stress uh, as we move forward. And then about half of our livestock operations would be in, in marginal or poor condition. Uh, our dairies and ranches combined, half of those would be in marginal or poor condition by the end of the 2026 period. And just to tie it up, uh, not, to, not to lump marginal and poor in as the same category, but, but anybody that's in marginal condition could potentially be seeing uh, uh, some struggles, maybe uh, securing financing for operating notes and that kind of thing. So uh, just because you're, you're not red yet doesn't mean that you're, you're not experiencing some, uh, some financial stress there. So again, just wanted to wrap up and appreciate everything. And uh, let me know if anybody has any questions and we'll certainly do our best to answer them or pass them on to somebody who can. Mark, thank you so much. We appreciate your insights. Uh, really appreciate that. And released at nine o'clock this morning was actually the outlook for the 2021 Missouri farm income. So the link for that is available in the chat box now. Okay, so you can click on that. And while you're kind of looking at that, we are excited to have Abigail Meffert joining us. She's the lead author on the project. She joins us to break down really what it all means for Missouri agriculture. Abigail actually is a Missourian herself. She grew up east of Columbia in a small farming community community and holds both a BS and MS in agricultural economics from Mizzou. 
Abigail, we are excited to hear your findings today. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks very much, Time. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am super excited to share the Missouri Farm Income Outlook with all of you on this beautiful morning um, coming from Central Missouri Mumford Hall University of Missouri campus. Um, let's just dive right into this here. So as many of you probably know, soybeans are the most popular crop grown in Missouri. We actually expect to reach 6 million acres of soybean area in 2021 if normal planting conditions prevail this spring. And of course, we're not sure. Like Pat mentioned earlier, it is wet in Missouri. We don't know if it will continue to be wet. But if it doesn't, we expect record soybean planted area in Missouri in 2021. Corn is expected to remain close to its 2020 level at about 3.4 million acres. And we expect the five crop planted area comprising soybeans, corn, wheat, rice, and cotton to return to about 2018 levels, once again, if we have normal spring weather in Missouri this year. Now let's take a look at our crop prices. This is gonna be really good news to you producers watching here today. We expect these soybean and corn prices to jump in marketing year 2020, 2021, and to really continue to remain significantly above those low levels of 2015 to 2019 marketing years. So why is this happening? As, as a couple of other presenters have mentioned earlier today, there was a lower harvest in fall of 2020 than we expected, along with increased demand from China for imports of our crop have led to a higher commodity prices. Now you guys need to remember, Missouri prices are typically going to track with national averages. However, local market conditions can affect basis. So our prices can be higher or lower than national averages, depending on what's actually going on in Missouri. Beef cow numbers were down 48,000 head from January 1st, 2020 to January 1st, 2021. A further slight decline is projected in the out years of our baseline outlook here. And this is because lower feeder cattle prices existed with the COVID-19 pandemic effects last year. Eventually, we're going to see smaller calf crops in Missouri because of that lower beef cow herd. And we also are looking at a dip in the sow herd in December 2020 versus a year ago. So just to give you guys a brief explanation, sow herd is measured by USDA on December 1st of each year. So we count December 1st, 2020 as our 2021 sow herd number. So if you look at the chart I have up here, you'll see that dip occur in 2021 instead of in 2020. And then along with that, the hog market are also going to decrease unless we have a major increase in in shipments to Missouri of pigs to be fed, which is not the normal way of the markets around the Midwest. So some more pretty exciting news here. It was not cool that livestock sector prices fell in 2020. And of course, that was because of issues in packing plants due to COVID-19, uh, backups of animals waiting to be processed. And then that, of course, led to higher consumer prices. We had a lot of problems there. But with some of that recovery, we are expecting the increase in prices for 2021 and further but those prices will not reach record levels of 2014 in the near term or the far term in our market outlook for Missouri. Some more pretty exciting news. Increased crop production and higher prices are going to lead to $6 billion, over $6 billion of cash receipts for crops in 2021, which is pretty cool. Soybeans are gonna account for almost half of this. Soybeans are super popular with farmers in Missouri. Slightly lower prices will lead to a decrease in these Crop, cash crop receipts during the out years of the baseline. However, this is they're still above the previous record of 2014 for the next several years. And on parallel with soybeans, on the livestock side, we have cattle. Cattle account for 43% of livestock sector receipts in 2021, exceeding the combined poultry and dairy receipts for Missouri. Higher hog and cattle prices are really what's going to be leading to this overall increase in livestock sector cash receipts in 2021, and those receipts will continue to increase throughout the duration of the baseline period, which if you don't know goes through 2030. We actually do see those levels approach the 2014 record all the way in 2030, so that's really something to look forward to for Missouri livestock producers. Now, here 
are my two kicker slides for this presentation. Look at government payments for Missouri. Government payments reached a new record in 2024 Missouri with about $1.65 billion in payments to Missouri. Those direct government payments increased 90% from 2018 to 2019 and another 46% from 2019 to 2020. The first increase is explained by MFP payments. The second explained by Paycheck Protection Program and CFAP payments to Missouri farmers. These projections do not include the relief bill that was passed in early March of this year. This only includes everything that was policy through the mid January of this year. Now we expect these levels, not counting what was passed in early March this year to return to pre-2018 assistance by 2022. We also expect very high Missouri net farm income in 2020. We, this net farm income was very low from 2015 to 2018, less than $2 billion a year. No bueno for Missouri farmers. But in 2020, we expect Missouri net farm income of $3.5 billion, which would break the previous record in 2014 of $3.4 billion. Now, net farm income is expected to fall in 2020 and 20, or sorry, 2021 and 2022, but will remain most likely over $2.5 billion. Why did this happen? Decrease in direct government payments and increase in production expenses. However, those rising cash receipts that I showed you earlier are going to easily offset these two things and lead to that higher level of net farm income going into the future, which we expect. But I would like you guys to note that errors in receipt or expense estimation can lead to errors in estimating net farm income. So we think there might be a record for 2020. It's only $0.1 billion, only $0.1 billion, but it's small comparative to the whole. That may not be a record when those numbers come out. Those numbers won't come out until August of this year from USDA, so we're waiting to see about that. But guys, this is really looking up for Missouri farmers. I want you all to take away from this presentation that things are starting to get better, prices are starting to go up. Hopefully, that will continue. Hopefully, our projections will be correct, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abby. You went through a lot of information there, a lot of good information that was just released. I mean, when you look at this data that came out and you look at, at 2021, we talked about the possible, you know, a lot lower uh, um, ad hoc government payments and things like that. But what do you feel like is the biggest risk uh, for the net farm income picture for Missourians, for Missouri agriculture in 2021? Honestly, at this point, I'm going to go with weather because those those crop cash receipts are we're projecting them to increase quite a bit. And if we have flooding this spring, like we saw in 2019 and 2015, that's really going to hammer those planted areas. That's really going to hammer the receipts we have for crops. And that could drive down net farm income farther in 2021. Yeah. And, um, you know, when you look back at, at, at 2020, you mentioned that, you know, it, it net farm income is projected to hit a record, but maybe uh, it may not when we get these final numbers. So, you know, go into that a little bit more, you know, what could change between now and, uh, you know, now and then and reporting wise that could, that could uh, lead us to, to not hit that record. Sure. So um, USDA Economic Research Service does the farm income release for the states in August of the following year. So they're actually still collecting information from farmers about last year to release that net farm income information in August. Um, a lot of, so the data itself isn't gonna change at this point. However, our model is based on the economic projections from IHS market that came out in January of this year. Um, so that stuff was happening before January of this year, obviously. So that's one thing that could affect it. Um, of course, there can just be, data errors, statistical errors, like I mentioned, with a record that's so close to the previous record, once again, any slight statistical problem could pop up and cause that not to be actually a record. Yeah, for sure. All right, Abby, thank you so much for joining us. That's all the questions we have today. We appreciate you very much. Now we're going to switch things over and, and wrap up with a panel, a great panel that we're going to be talking about emerging issues in agriculture. And so returning to the program, 
We have Dr. Scott Brown. We couldn't let him get away with just talking for a little bit. We had to bring him back. He's going to join us uh, for his insights. But then we also, uh, it's a pleasure to have joining us Dr. Joe Outlaw. Joe serves as the co-director of the Agricultural and Food Policy Center at Texas A&M University. And he frequently interacts with members of Congress and key agricultural committee staff to provide feedback. So he's in the trenches, finding that information, directly relaying that to Washington, D.C. And so welcome uh, Dr. Outlaw to the program to give us some of that insight. And then we also are excited to have Ben Brown. He serves as the Senior Research Associate with MU Extension, the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute. He started in January, but from talking to him, he's already out in the field, did a couple talks this week with the Missouri groups. Uh, you know, he was previously a faculty member at the Ohio State University and director of the OSU uh, Farm Management Program. So when you look at his area of work, it really focuses on applied farm management with interest in U.S. farm policy, commodity price analysis, farm financial performance, and of course, He's a good old Missouri farm kid. So we appreciate you joining us today, Ben. All right, let's kick things off. I'm going to ask each of you this first question. What do you see as the biggest challenge, the biggest emerging issue for U.S. farmers and ranchers in 2021? Dr. Outlaw, I'll pick on you first. Sure. Uh, I don't want to be a downer, but I, I guess I, my, my challenge is for producers not to be too um, overzealous about these good prices we're, we're seeing right this second. I think that the factory baseline, some people would say that it's too pessimistic relative to the futures and things like that. But uh, when Scott Brown and I were both young graduate students doing this work uh, a long time ago, every meeting we would do in, in Kansas City for baseline reviews, we would, if someone would start with, well, if China continues to do these things, we're going to all be rich for the rest of our lives. And those things never have happened. Uh, maybe for short spurts, but not consistent. So the, my biggest thing is, I hope people don't go and start buying a bunch of property based off of these prop prices, because I don't think they're going to be around. Yeah, Dr. Brown, what do you see as the biggest challenge this year? So actually, uh, I think Joe's reminding us, uh, so, so for me, risk management. Um, it is key to, to things that producers are going to have to pay attention to this year. Uh, th there are opportunities here to lock in reasonable returns. And I'm more than happy with singles and doubles in terms of what happens this year for producers uh, in, instead of the home run ball. Um, and and I, I think, you know, I, I look at the pork industry here for a minute. There's some great opportunities to lock in some reasonable returns, both for hog prices and higher feed costs. Uh, think back to the last time we had uh, corn prices at these levels and it wasn't so good. So when do folks want to pull the trigger to do some risk management? I wish I had a crystal ball that told me exactly when the right time was, but I do worry. All right. So we talk about all the positives of COVID-19 that could happen in 2021. Yet what happens if consumers run out of money in their pocket as we get further into this recovery? Th does that create some weaker demand than we've seen for a while. All of these things, there are downside risk to, to these uh, currently higher prices that I think we need to be paying attention to. Ben, that same question to you. What do you yeah. feel is the biggest challenge this year? Yeah, and Scott took my answer. I was also going to say risk management, um, but that's my answer regardless of the year. Um, I, I think producers need to think about risk management in all areas. Uh, it just probably is a bigger issue this year when we're looking at some of these higher prices uh, with a great, uh, it's great that prices are higher uh, unless you're a livestock producer and you're having to feed some of these things, but it also increases the downside risk. And so, you know, Scott and Joe both mentioned that. The, the thing I'd add, since Scott took my answer is, you know, I'll add, I, I look out in the next couple of years and one of the things that I think from a management perspective is for our producers here in Missouri or across the country to really start developing an entrepreneurial mindset. Look for opportunities to increase the value of your products. Uh, I, I love to use examples of relationship building that farmers have, have made with a, a processor or with a, a product. I think of white corn, I think of popcorn, I think of food grade soybeans. You know, these are all products that we're not going to implement for all of our farmers and all you know 90 million acres of soybeans and corn that we have but certainly for some of our producers they can start looking for those opportunities and start 
developing those supply chains. Now, risk management comes back into this as well. What do you do if you're growing food grade soybeans for the one processor down the road and that processor stops taking soybeans, right? Um, so certainly that risk, I always like to say that a, an ounce of loyalty is, is more than a, you know, a pound of cleverness. Um, making sure that you're developing and taking care of those relationships as you go, go along. So uh, outside of risk management, uh, I, I would say the entrepreneurship mindset is something that I would encourage our producers to think about um, to address some of these concerns that we have about the, the long run effect of, of increased acres and lower prices. Dr. Brown, you mentioned the economy. What happens when the stimulus money that we've seen that's really helped in, in, you know, inject some optimism into this, into this economy and, and give some spending dollars, what happens when that stimulus money disappears? Yeah, so it's my big concern about kind of the second half of 2021. I, I kind of look and I go, folks are going to want to get out. All right. So and, and, and I think about that and I remind my producers in rural Missouri that we're not nor, we're not average in terms of an average U.S. consumer, that you got to look at the coast. And, and I think the coasts, both coasts have been much more in a lockdown situation from COVID-19 than we have. And they're they're going to want to go. And yet you get six, seven months down the road and all of a sudden, hey, I, I still would like to go, but. I have no longer have that money sitting in my pocket. Uh, that that could spell some tougher times for us. Uh, we've had a really good demand run going, and and I'm not ready to say it's over, but weaker demand could certainly hurt these prices. Now, I'll just again remind us: let's take box beef prices. Box beef prices are about fifteen dollars uh, below where they were a year ago at this time. So, you know, let's let's make sure that. Uh, we understand there's that downside that comes from a general economy that could slow with less stimulus. Yeah, Joe, I mean, is that a concern of yours as, as well when it comes to some stimulus? Well, anytime that the, the government gets involved in helping folks and then they stop, uh, it, it, it creates sort of a, a interruption in what would have normally happened. So yeah, I think Scott's right. I mean, uh, the big the big deal to me is is that I think there are plenty of people who are ready to get out, um, and and in the state I'm in, you know, we're we're kind of getting out a lot more than most people are, and uh, uh, it's kind of like the wild west here. But uh, uh, not everyone's like that, and I think that when those folks get to get out, I think Scott's right. They're going to start going and eating out a lot more. Well, speaking uh, of that, you know, can when I you get it on record? Yep, Can I get it on record that Joe said Scott's right twice in a, in a matter of 60 seconds? Sorry, time. For well, he did also say when we were young. So I don't know if that <laughs> takes off a point or not, but I just, you know, just want to throw that out there. Uh, and Joe, when you look at the government funds, also when you look at ad hoc payments, and I know that we had some more announcements this week from USDA, but when you look at the large expectation that we're not going to see record ad hoc government payments this year, when that just completely shuts off, and maybe we don't have the prices that we have today. How big of a concern is that for you? Okay, so for this year, I'm not really all that concerned. I think the producers are going to be smart enough to lock in prices that are going to they're going to make money off of this year. If they don't, they probably deserve to be knocked out. Um, the The reality is is that that next year is where I think things get a little tight. You know, I spend most of my time along with Pat and others working with Congress on designing and helping with safety net stuff and, uh, and all I can tell you is we have a fairly strong safety net but it's at levels that are that are the producers are going to endure a lot of uh, pain before the, the safety net kicks in so I don't think we have a uh, we have a strong safety net but we don't have a overly lucrative safety net and the fact of the matter is I think that that's going to be a big shock for producers um, there's going to be right, well, like for right now I think that more people are interested in the crop insurance announced prices that become at the beginning of the year than they are anything to do with ARCA PLC. And so because of that, this year is kind of a one-off. When we start looking at it next year and those futures prices haven't run up to set the to set the stage for a lot of protection under revenue coverages, that's when I think you're going to see people kind of start getting squeamish. So um, Ben, before I move to you, Joe, one follow-up to that then. You know, when you look at the farm bill and you look at the reliance on some of the ad hoc payments that we have that we've had coming out. And now, as we discuss the next farm bill, 
how do we make a farm bill that's relevant again? Well, you can't do it without more money. Is this really the way to do it? I hate to say that as an economist, it sounds stupid, but but the reality is you have to have more money so that you can provide uh, greater protection, different types of protection. I honestly think that, uh, uh, you know, I've done this long enough to, to, to go through cycles where uh, I can remember after different farm bills were passed and the prices were high, there were a lot of people that said, we really don't need this anymore. Why are we even doing this? And then within two years, usually on average two years, we're having to do something special to, to kind of fix things. So uh, to me, everyone's saying, you know, the ad hoc, it doesn't go into the baseline. So it, it's not there for the future baseline development. Um, it, it, it's going to, everything is going to be a challenge going forward. Uh, we got to, you're going to end up asking a lot of things about carbon that I'm ready to talk about, but, but, but the reality is I see that the, the, the next farm bill is going to look a lot different. Yeah, we do want to get into carbon, but before we do that, Ben, I've had some analysts on the show recently who say, you know, considering this aggressive battle for acres this year, the aggressive battle that we could potentially have next year, just because of prices, just because of the tight stock scenario that we're in right now, that maybe we're looking at about a two year runway for this bull market. Do you think that this market today does have legs for two years? Well, and, you know, certainly in, in Dr. Westhoff's presentation earlier, he showed that even with some pretty aggressive soybean acres, uh, soybean stocks stay relatively tight and prices stay relatively elevated. Uh, and so I look at the soybean picture and I, and I, you know, I, I'm very optimistic about what those prices could be going forward. Uh, I would caution and say, as Abby mentioned, whether I'll have a lot to dictate with this. Certainly we saw this in 2019. Uh, we probably overstated how many corn acres were going to be turned into uh, soybean acres uh, due to the fact that Dr. Outlaw just mentioned uh, those high crop insurance prices. If you think back to 2019, we had some decent crop insurance prices. Um, I say decent, but when we look at where prices were by the time things rolled around at planting, uh, a lot of producers were looking at those prevent plant guarantees and realizing, hey, maybe our best option uh, is prevent plant as a as a third management decision. And I think we saw that a little bit in 2020 as well. Now, certainly if we take acres out of production uh, due to prevent plant conditions or you know just market collapses similar to you know whatever, uh, I'm, I'm gonna reference last year's COVID collapse when producers were looking at sub $3 cash corn uh, and saying, you know, I, I can't I can't be profitable at these levels. Now the markets rallied. But outside of that, I do think there are is room uh, for this market to continue, uh, and and when I think about um, you know is it going to continue to rise? Probably not, but I, I certainly think we're at a different playing field due to the some of the things uh, Dr. Uh, Meyer mentioned earlier with you know that ratio that hit in August. We had the late season drought reducing those crop surprises, and we've seen robust demand uh, to this point. So I do think that that is possible. Um, as we as you go forward, but specifically to your your acreage question, uh, I, I've had a lot of fun talking with producers about their acreage decision this year, and it's been interesting to see them think through the rationale for how they're they're doing that. The fertilizer prices that we've seen have definitely tilted the scale a little bit more towards soy, soybeans um, than what we probably saw two months ago. A couple of reasons for that: it just takes less fertilizer to plant an acre of soybeans. Um, but then on the reverse side of that, farmers love to plant corn. Um, they love to harvest corn, and as a result of harvesting corn, they love to plant corn. Um, and so uh, we, you know, once we get into this planting window fully, uh, we'll start to have a better picture of what that looks like. But I do expect, I, I guess I'm tilting a little bit to the prevent or the planting intentions report at the end of the month. I'm expecting big, big numbers. I think producers are going to tell USDA that they're they're going to plant every acre they have. And certainly we've seen some acreage come out of CRP too. So I don't think there's going to be mar many marginal acres not planted this spring. Yeah, Scott, and when you look at the, the price outlook at the same time, Ben mentioned the input side of it and seeing those climate expenses. I mean, you know, Scott, I talked to a, a local farm supplier this week who said, listen, because of the high polymer prices and, and the prices of plastics, I'm worried about sourcing bale wrap this year, even sourcing it, not just to mention how much it has gone up. And so when you look at that expense side this year and how quickly it's risen, I mean, how big of a concern is that for, you know, overall expenses on, on the farm and ranch side this year? Yeah, so I think you can almost look at all those inputs and say we've gotten a lot of inflation that's been occurring. And, and I think that it's a good point to make here about COVID-19 added costs. 
I don't care what you're producing. In some ways, it's different in terms of how those costs got added. But just social distancing and plants or, or whatever, transportation, distribution, every piece of that puzzle got, cost got uh, escalated. I don't know that we unravel that uh, as, as quickly coming back down. Uh, but, but, and so we could be in a situation where, in fact, our output prices come down yet the inputs stay up there as all of these added costs as a result of dealing with COVID-19 kind of hang with us uh, for a longer period of time. So we could find ourselves in that cost price squeeze as we get further into this year time. I, I think that's a, a, a good point to be made. You know, how much are you focused on inflation right now, Scott? I mean, you mentioned it and we've heard some crazy price projections lately based on the idea that we could see some, some possible hyperinflation. I mean, is that even realistic at this point? I'm, so I'm, I'm probably not in the hyperinflation camp. I, I am in the camp that I think we're going to see costs that are going to continue to stay high and we'll get some inflation uh, go, going in front of us. I, I suppose that's another reason to be worried about how consumers behave. Uh, if we're talking about uh, pushing those uh, uh, interest rates higher, et cetera. Um, I'll sometimes go, even where gasoline prices sit today, uh, how does that curb what they're willing to spend on food? Because now all of a sudden filling that tank is a lot more expensive than it was a year ago at this time. Well, Dr. Outlaw, you mentioned carbon earlier. And as we look at producers looking for another revenue stream, it seems like there may be an opportunity right now in this chase to capture carbon. So, you know, ag groups are saying, listen, it's both an opportunity, but it is a challenge. How do you view the carbon market today when it comes to, to farmers and ranchers? Well, for, that, that's, that is the question on carbon. It's, it's, to me, uh, it is an opportunity. And when I've been talking to producers about this opportunity, uh, though, there's been a number of people, including probably people tuning in here that have looked into the existing markets and opportunities within the existing markets and said, you know, about $20, whatever, $20 an acre. <laughs> and, and they don't think about uh, people who are buying these credits have to have proof. And they're going to be wanting you to provide information to prove that you've done these practices and very specific information, not just a little bit, but quite a bit of information. And so I, I always warn producers that yes, this is an opportunity and all bets are off because the government is not involved yet. When the government gets involved, it could either be really, really good or it could go the other way. Um, and so uh, when we do have, all I've said is let's, let's kind of take a measured approach and look at this and let people like our group, we, we're spending an enormous amount of time uh, working with, with producers on, on the different practices that they have to do to, to, uh, to uh, be eligible for carbon credits. Uh, it, it, it is a wonderful opportunity but it's like every opportunity, you have to understand what you're getting yourself into. Yeah, and understanding that, you mentioned Texas was a bit of the Wild West right now. Well, Dr. Outlaw, from what I understand, the carbon market, it is also a bit of the Wild West. And you have some analysis that comes in that says, listen, when it comes down to it, farmers and ranchers are only getting about 5 to 10 percent of, of that money because it's the ones in the middle that are capturing most of that. And so when you look at possibly crafting policy and really as farmers then enter into some of these carbon agreements, what are some, some words of caution that you're giving them? What are you telling them to really watch out for and understand before you enter into some of these potential long-term contracts? Well, that's, that's a great question. And, and, and just a, a little bit of history. Uh, back in 2008, we did an analysis at the request of uh, Senator Saxby Chambliss of the Waxman bill, which was the cap and trade bill that was the Obama plan, uh, Obama administration plan. Uh, we looked at it and at those times, uh, the net to the producer carbon prices across the US were somewhere in the seven to $10 range. And we found without a lot of effort that the uh, energy costs that were gonna go along with capping, the, the cap part of it, not the trading part, but the capping these emissions uh, the energy increases were going to offset that for pretty much everybody other than the Midwest. And so fast forward to now, I have that history. I've done this before and people are still talking about it in the same kind of uh, 
the, the, the producers that are going to have all this new revenues. And my answer is you always have to be careful of what your expectations, you, you know, adjust your expectations. Yes. If there's a, if there's an ability to make money, I guarantee you between factory and my, our group, we're going to make sure producers know how to sign up for that and, and, and take advantage of that. But you are going to have to, to really watch this very closely because I, I, there's already things that are happening out there in the current, what I call private market. That's not very good. Yeah, and we're keeping a close eye on that too, Dr. Outlaw. Thanks for that insight. All right, Ben, to boil it back down though, on, you know, to, to Missouri farmer and rancher level, you know, we just heard a lot today about the net farm income projections, especially when it comes to Missouri and what we saw last year and heading into this year, expectation for, you know, possible ad hoc government payments, possibly not. You know, when you look at everything though, it seems like 2020 and 2021 are going to be pretty good, largely for Missouri farmers and ranchers. Is that consistent with what you're seeing? Well, certainly 2020 turned out to be a lot better than what we thought 10 months ago, um, nine months ago, when we were when we were looking at farm income projections for farmers across the, you know, the country, not just here in Missouri. Things are a lot better and turned out to be a lot better. Certainly when um, you, know, you visit with farmers out in the field, a lot of them are spending money to increase or improve their operations. Uh, there's a lot of tile that's been going on. You talk with the tile folks, they're having one of the best years uh, they've ever had. Uh, you talk with the, the, the people that put up steel bins, uh, whoever that might be, they're getting a lot of interest there as well. So, you know, when we, when we think about, um, you know, how, how farmers receive cash, uh, you know, if it comes through the market, they, they tend to treat that cash differently than what they treat a government payment, right? And I, I kind of treat this a little bit like a tax return, right? We do different things with our tax return than what we do with our income we get from our employer. And certainly what we've seen is people taking that, that additional income, turning it into asset improvements, expanding their, you know, their, their business. But we're also seeing quite a few people look to expand their business. And that's where I, I go back to one of the very first things Dr. Outlaw said today about you know, land prices and running out and buying land. I like to remind some of our farmers that you don't need a piece of land that's worth $6,000 that's being sold for $10,000. Um, you can find some land that will fit in elsewhere, let somebody else pay that for it. Um, and so I look in and I, and I so far have been positive, I have been pleased, I guess is how I should say, with how farmers have been spending their money. Uh, a lot of them spent that extra cash on, uh, or at least the cash that they got from government assistance on, on increased crop insurance payments. Some of them bought up crop insurance tiers or they just used that money to pay the higher premiums that we saw this year. Um, you know, that that's going to help with the risk reduction strategy as well. So I guess to answer your question time more specifically is yes, at least on the ground, you know, there's, I'd say in general, people have have showed and are experiencing at least relatively good financial times and they're working down some of that debt, but that does not apply to everybody. There are still producers out there that are hurting. Um, probably most uh, are in the cow calf business or the cattle business. And I, I'll defer to Scott to make sure that that's accurate, but at least that's where I hear most of the pressure coming from is from the majority of the cattle producers expressing that they're still tight on finances. Okay, well, I wanna get down to one more question before I get all of your closing thoughts, okay? And we only have a few minutes, uh, but Dr. Brown, you know, we're seeing some focus this week on that livestock market transparency, and we're seeing some bills that are introduced. And it looks like it's a pretty divisive issue. I mean, certain states aren't agreeing on it. It's not just, you know, everybody's in one camp. Um, when you look at this act that's that's being brought up from a, from an economist standpoint, do you think this market needs more transparency? And what issues do you think we have in getting a bill like this passed? Yeah, so it's the most difficult question I think we get to face here in, in terms of what's the best path forward. I, I will say the, the easy answer to this is, uh, but more price discovery is always better from an economist point of view. So we'll start with that of the more price discovery you can do, the better. And, and are I think that then leads to the issue of, are these markets uh, providing enough cash trade to have good price discovery? And that's really where we've been uh, in, in tangled. And, and I'll say it's not the same for every state, right? So some of the bills that we have out there might work well in states like Iowa and not work so well in states like Texas. And, and it's the way that cattle have been traded in the case of cattle here, but between those differences. So how do you how do you allow the flexibility for what's a different regional activity that's occurring yet 
feel comfortable that you have good price discovery? I, I, there's no simple answer to this question. I think we have to continue to make sure we have enough price discovery, enough cash trade happening to feel comfortable that we have underlying supply and demand uh, being represented in the prices that, that producers are being paid. I sometimes go, I hate to have this price discovery discussion in the midst of COVID-19. It, it added a lot of, of craziness to markets that we would have never anticipated what was going to happen. And, and let's make sure we think about how we want to handle price discovery in what I hope in the next few years is not a repeat of something like the pandemic that we just came through. A very uh, big topic to have you answer in only a few minutes, but Scott, I appreciate you. All right, I'm, we, we only have about a minute left. I'm gonna give each of you about 30 seconds to just wrap up and what you want um, everyone joining us today, what do you want them to know for 2021? Dr. Outlaw, I will start with you. Just that for 2021, I think that uh, good business decisions are gonna be key uh, to keeping Keeping in track of the fact that uh, while things look good, you have to plan for the future. I don't like being a negative person all the time, but you have to think about the future when you're making business decisions because these markets can turn rather quickly and they do all the time. All right, Dr. Brown. So, so I'll go back to the risk side of this and I'll, I'll say, don't forget, we're coming out of a pandemic that we haven't seen for decades. Uh, maybe I should say longer than decades, we're not going to get all this right in 2021. Things are going to happen that we did not anticipate as hopefully we continue to recover from COVID-19 that, that has gripped us for so many of the last several months. Let's make sure we're careful about how we move forward under that uncertain future. All right, and Ben. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to stick on the same theme of decision making. I like to remind folks that we're looking at some of our lowest interest rates, real interest rates we, we've seen uh, in a long time. Certainly, you know, we, we started hearing comments out of the Federal Reserve to start increasing some of those interest rates. And, uh, you know, I, I remind that that has a big impact on debt load. And so for those producers out there, you know, make sure that you're, you're keeping an eye on that. And certainly we've seen an increase in fixed rate interest uh, over, over the years, but that doesn't fix everything. And so... Uh, I, I would just add that into the decision making theme uh, as something to keep in mind. And then also just a reminder that at these prices, we're seeing most most producers are profitable on the crop sector. And uh, I'll just I'll end with that and say that you can be profitable. But I realized that the last two years, early season grain marketing has, has left a sour taste in, in folks mouth. Um, and in 2019 into 20, uh, the USDA awarded you know, CFAP dollars on unmarketed 2019 product. In 2020, those that marketed early missed out on some of the higher prices we've seen here at the end. So uh, certainly with the prices we've seen, there's opportunities to be profitable, even though the last two years maybe haven't turned out as, as well as we'd hoped. Ben, a really good point. Thank you to you. Thank you to Dr. Outlaw. And thank you, Dr. Brown. And, and Ben, again, a big thanks to you. He's been working magic behind the scenes to make sure everything's running smoothly. So Ben, welcome back. And, and thank you so much for your help. Well, that wraps up. Our, our conference today. And that concludes the 2021 Abner W. Womack Missouri Agriculture Outlook Conference. Thank you to all of our presenters, all the information that we were trying to digest today a lot, but do not forget that all of these reports from today, you can download and we'll actually have the recording as well. So do not forget that you can get those additional reports. They'll be published throughout the year, updating some of these findings based on current policy, market conditions. You can do all of that on the websites. They are there on your screen. Um, and, and don't forget to also uh, make sure to fill out that program evaluation so we can really take that feedback and, uh, and, and take that input and, and really have that to help formulate our, our, our next event. But we hope you enjoyed yourself today and learned a lot. I know I certainly did. Thank you to all of our panelists who took the time um, to highlight some of these findings as well as give us an outlook of what they're expecting in 2021. As we heard, a lot changed, a lot of unexpected uh, things happened in, in, in 2020 that really changed agriculture um, um, and maybe possibly uh, change for years to come. So we really appreciate that insight. And for any remaining questions, please feel free to reach out to the folks at FAPRI by going to fapri.missouri.edu. Be safe. Thank you everyone for joining us today. You can catch me this weekend on US Farm Report and our Farm Journal magazines, as well as our website, agweb.com. But thank you so much for everything that you do in, in your work to improve Missouri agriculture. Have a great weekend, everyone. <music>